Hello and welcome to Hobby Homies. We are your weekly tabletop podcast. I'm Shane, as always, hanging out on the World Wide Web with Fox. Howdy, coming to you live from the internet. A couple, <laughs> couple of homies, many miles apart. Many, many miles indeed. Um, today, we are kicking back and we're going for a bit of a bit of a deep dive. Hell yeah. Putting on the goggles, metaphorically, because I left mine at your house <laughs> and I only own one pair of goggles like any sane person. <laughs> Of course. Of course. Who needs two pairs? <laughs> well, I mean, we did for the collective mm. Hobby Homies team. In fact, we should get Churchy yeah, of course. some. Yes, Churchy does need some for the third man of our little crew <laughs> in these deep dives. Maybe a scuba suit. We'll get him the full, yeah, yeah. One of the normal, <laughs> one, one of those with the big Yeah, oh, the old school ones, the big cast iron ones. Yeah, that go yeah. On the big brass ones. Yeah. He's just in there <laughs> profusely sweating trying to edit our episodes in the studio and we're sitting there with goggles. <laughs> that feels fair yeah 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 yeah. that's fair but yeah so this is a deep dive although hell yeah i know so for those who don't know the concept of deep dive we take a topic uh it may be law for a faction from a war game it could be the rpgs D &D itself there's a few that we've done in the past and we really and i say we shane really dives in (laughs) and you've done one i've done one yeah i have done one what was i can't remember harlequins there you go yeah. And so we go yeah. we go into the archives, we go into old libraries, old dusty libraries and dusty find dusty books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Books, relics of eons ago. Scrolls even? I would say scrolls are a, a must. Yeah. If we oh, of course. if we don't acquire scrolls, we can't do a deep dive. <laughs> no, of course not. So, but however I know nothing about the deep dive you've prepared. You've told me nothing. Yeah. So, well, let us let us begin. Okay. So today we are taking a deep dive into the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Hell yeah! And not just his works, but also his life as well. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yes the the oldest and most intense emotion of humanity is fear, and the oldest and most intense of fears is the fear of the unknown. H.P. Lovecraft. Oh. This man is on another plane. <laughs> He's in a different corporeal dimension. That he is. <laughs> while the while the war game or RPG scene may have been before H.P. Lovecraft's time, there is no doubt that his works have inspired and influenced creators up until this very day. Without the world of ex- existential dread and horrors so unimaginable, there'd be no saying where pop culture would have led without his work. Mm. I want to quickly chime in here and i don't know if you know this shane i think you do i couldn't <laughs> know less about hp lovecraft and <laughs> hp lovecraftian yep. designs than i do i couldn't know less so i'm i'm coming at this with the the op- most open mind and the smoothest of brains i'm gonna have a lot of questions <laughs> well strap in <laughs> goggles are on and a wild ride, dude. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Howard Phillips Lovecraft was born on the 20th of August in 1890 in Providence, Rhode Island. He lived with his mother, Susan, and father, Winfield, up until the age of three when his father was institutionalized for general paresis, also known as paralytic dementia, believed to be brought upon by late stage syphilis. Standard. The old syphilis <laughs> How- got him. <laughs> oh, I got everyone back in these days, dude. Yeah. Howard's grandparents on his mother's side resided with him and his mother. Whipple, Howard's grandfather, became a father figure to him in this time, Lovecraft noting that my grandfather became the center of my entire universe. Whipple traveled often for work and maintained a near constant correspondence by letter with young Howard, who by the age of three was already proficient at reading and writing. It's true. It was his grand... Oh man, I at the age of 10, I don't think I could read and write. No way. And not to mention... <laughs> But we didn't have grandfathers named, I'm sorry, Whipple? Whipple, yes. Whipple. <laughs> it was a name. It was a name. How do you spell How that? Do- W-H-I-P-P-L-E. Whipple. <laughs> Why am I saying what, what way? <laughs> Man, Whip- Whipple. That's, yeah. That blows my mind. And also- it's a name. Even his, even his dad's name is Winfield. You know, that's an unusual name as well. It is, but it's not on- it's More of a surname. Yeah. But Whipple's not mm. even a name, <laughs> sir, or otherwise. Just a noise. Yeah. Whipple's just a noise. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, anyways. 
Well, that's yeah, that's set me back, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll carry on. <laughs> it, it was his grandfather, Whipple, who encouraged Lovecraft to have an appreciation of literature, but more specifically classical literature and English poetry. Mm. He entertains Lovecraft by telling him original tales of winged horrors, deep, low moaning sounds, and the exact sources of these tales were never identified. Lovecraft himself guessed that they may have originated from Gothic novelists like Anne Radcliffe or Matthew Lewis. Hmm. Now, deep, low moaning sounds sounds like me after about 12 of these in the morning. Three. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I was, You're right. thinking, I was thinking, right. of something, yeah, <laughs> thinking of something else. I was thinking of your low intolerance to alcohol. I was, <laughs> I was thinking of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ex- so, what would you say? Deep? Low moaning sounds. Yeah. What is that? I mean, I mean, I know what that uh, is. Not, I'm not, uh, not tempted to try and replicate those sounds. Please, please do. I think I speak on no. behalf of everyone when I say, please, please do. <laughs> so much better than I could have expected. <laughs> I opened my mouth and I was like, I don't know what sound's going to come out, but let's just hit it. <laughs> uh, stand by it. Clip that. Stand by it. Me too, actually. Oh, man. Oh, can that be our intro what? song? <laughs> no. <laughs> We've already got one of those. Okay. <laughs> it's marginally better. Lovecraft's grandmother passed away in 1896. Even though there was no indication that he was particularly close with her, her death had a profound effect. Mm. His mother's aunt and aunt's wearing of black mourning dresses terrified him at that time. Lovecraft, being around five years old, was plagued with terrifying dreams that would later inform his writings. Wow. These nightmares contained beings he called Night Gaunts, who would whirl him through space at sickening speeds while tormenting him with tridents. That's some other shit. <laughs> Man, I had some bad yeah. dreams as a kid, but I mean, it was like getting chased by bigger humans. <laughs> and, <laughs> Just like big kids. And, you know, the slow punching dream and the slow oh, running that, dream. That was the worst. The well, I thought punching. it was. <laughs> I've heard about this guy. <laughs> I didn't have a single trident make it even an appearance in my dreams. <laughs> this guy gets all the good stuff true true lovecraft's earliest known liter- literary works were written at the age of seven they were poems restyling the odyssey and other greco-roman mytholo- mythological stories he would later write that as a child he was fixated on the greco-roman pantheon and accepted them as as genuine expressions of divinity foregoing his christian upbringing at the age of eight lovecraft took a keen interest in the sciences particularly astronomy and chemistry. And he also examined anatomy books available to him in the family library. That's another thing that we don't have these days is a family library. Yeah, the um, boom is really fucked up for us. <laughs> True. If, 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 <laughs> if, uh, if the internet has told me anything, it's if we're missing out on something in this current generation, it's the boom. It's is the boom. Is, yeah. yeah, that's why the housing market's fucked too. Exactly. If we yeah. could buy cheaper houses... <laughs> With more room, we could afford a library. We could fit a library in there. Yeah, <laughs> but also the books are dead because we have the internet. So of course, <laughs> our library now is just Wikipedia. Yeah, we've got everything. We've got every book in the history. I wonder how um, romanticized this era of um, Lovecraft's life is. So mm. I wonder because when I hear that, I think, "Gee, what a genius!" Right, like writing stuff at seven, Greek mythology into yeah. um, chemistry and. What was the other one? Astronomy. Astronomy. And he was reading anat- anatomy books. Then I think to me at seven, and I wrote a really terrible like Dragon Ball Z story. And it was garbage. <laughs> and I also like looking yeah. at um, the Guinness World Record books and also like weird anatomy books as well. And I was like, is yeah. it more like what I was doing? I mean, probably not because he's a genius. <laughs> but at the same time, were, was his stuff any good? You say, he was in, you say he was into astrology. Was he just like, my style looks cool. Someone's like, <laughs> yeah. my God, this kid's got it. <laughs> so I wonder about I that. I don't know, dude. I think he's pretty. I think he's pretty switched on. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the dude was what <laughs> reading and writing at three. Yeah. So I imagine he's at seven writing better things than I've ever written. So <laughs> yeah, but yeah. who knows? He's basically thirty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> By the year nineteen hundred. Lovecraft's grandfather, Whipple Van Buren Phillips's family business ventures were beginning to take a downwards turn. Mm. 
and his family's wealth was was slowly reduced. Was this? It was sorry. Was this because he named the family business after himself? <laughs> he used his full name. <laughs> what was his full I don't name know. again? It might, it might have had an effect. <laughs> Whipple Van Buren Phillips. <laughs> so he called it Whipple Van Fur- Van Buren Phillips Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Nash doesn't say what the company's name was. It just said that he's uh, various business ventures. Okay. <laughs> so, who knows? <laughs> it was a uh, Herbalife mum. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Still on those scentsy candles or something. <laughs> hey, man, that's a, that's a thing. Anyway, sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> he was forced to let his family's hired servants go. Oh. leaving Lovecraft, Susie, and Whipple alone in the family home. <laughs> in the spring of 1904, Whipple's largest business venture suffered a catastrophic failure, and within months, he suffered a stroke and died at the age of 70. Jesus. After her father's death, Susie was unable to support the upkeep of the expensive family home on her father's estate. Later that year, she was forced to move herself and her son to a small townhouse. Wow. Lovecraft referred to this time as one of the darkest in his life stating in a letter written in 1934 that he saw no point in living anymore. He had considered the possibility of committing suicide. At how old? At his scientific, uh, by uh, 1904, he was 14. That is nutty. Yeah. Yeah. This is a kid in tune with his inner self and fully aware. That's an adult brain in a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Taking in all this crazy stuff. Far out. Oh, man, he's already been through heaps. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, where was I? Yeah, so consider the possibility of committing suicide. But his scientific curiosity and the desire to know more about the world had prevented him from doing so. Hmm. In the autumn of 1904, Lovecraft entered high school. Though much like his earlier years, he was at times removed from school for long periods that what he termed as nervous breakdowns. He did say, though, while having some conflicts with teachers, that he enjoyed high school, becoming close with a small circle of friends and performed well academically, excelling in chemistry and physics. It was during this period that Lovecraft produced his first of his fictional works that he would, that would later be known for, The Beast in the Cave and The Alchemist. They're cool names. I've always liked Yeah, alchemy-related things. I'm going to have to read some of his books. Oh, man. And, like, he... Actually, a fun fact, he actually never wrote a full-length novel. He wrote all short stories. Yeah, great. So That's more my speed. I got, oh, man. <laughs> I, I got audio books that go for like 15 minutes, which is one of his stories. Far out. So, That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's it, like I was listening to so many of them while, while doing all this research. Did it, um, did, did it give you, do you think, a different perspective of him than I would have listening to it and just learning about his life? Do you view him? You mean you mean listening to his work or yeah, reading his work yeah, first? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you, um, does it paint a different picture when you learnt about him? Oh yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Like you sort of you can see a lot of the stuff that had that he was going through in his life. Like mm. later on in in his life, you can sort of see that reflected in his stories. Yeah. Um, not a mirror reflection, obviously, but you sort of get these vibes about how he was feeling at the time that he wrote it or what, you know, what was going on in his life when he wrote that particular story. Yeah. Um, It's crazy too, that at just such like a young age, he's able to take, take his life circumstances and turn them into something creative and abstract that still like allows him to almost vent and carry on and talk about his situation without saying it directly. He's cool. I like yeah. him. Yeah. I think he's a bit of a homie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to nominate him. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. He, he wins homie of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you this one. Okay. <laughs> In 1908, prior to what would have been his high school graduation, Lovecraft suffered another unidentified health crisis, though in this instance was seemingly more severe than any before. The circumstances remain unknown and the, and the only direct records are Lovecraft's own letter correspondence where he described it as a nervous collapse due to the pressure of high school despite enjoying it. Hmm. In, in a later letter, he wrote, I am prey to intense headaches, insomnia and general nervous weakness, which prevents my continuous application to anything. Um, another quick fun fact is he wrote thousands of letters throughout his lifetime. Like it, there's so many references here in a letter that he wrote. Um, 
And it was just like he was just sending letters to anyone that would accept letters, I, was, I think, at some points. I was going to say, like, who, where is he sending these? To Santa? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, he's sending these to people. He's not, like, keeping a diary or something. No, yeah, sending letters to friends and family and stuff like that. Sure. Like it, like earlier, he was in constant correspondence with his grandfather while he was away. Yeah, Whipple. So, letter after letter. So, yeah, um, yeah it's crazy. Interesting. I um, Yeah. It sounds like, I, I don't know, but it sounds like he had anxiety, massive anxiety attacks during a time <clears> when <throat> that probably wasn't something that was as identified or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, as, absolutely. It's interesting. Because like- Yeah, absolutely. He talks about the pressures of high school, but I mean, I don't know anything about the era, but I mean, it's high school. <laughs> and like, <laughs> there's no, it doesn't sound like he's got um, like- parental figures putting all this pressure on him so where is that coming from no it sounds like it yeah anxious compounding yeah interesting yeah yeah interesting. uh lovecraft maintained that he would be going to brown university after high school though he never graduated or attended school again hmm. whether it was a physical ailment a mental one or a combination of both has never been determined an account from a high school classmate described lovecraft exhibiting terrible tics Hmm. A psychology professor examined the account and claimed that chorea minor was the probable cause of Lovecraft's childhood symptoms, and instances of chorea minor in adulthood are very rare. The same professor further ventures Lovecraft's 1908 breakdown as attributed to a, a hysteroid seizure, which became synonymous with atypical depression. Hmm. So, yeah, that's something they looked into later on down the track and, and have come up with the conclusion that's what probably was affecting him. Yeah, atypical depression. Yeah, hmm. at- so atypical depression. Um, I only looked it up briefly, but it 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 fluctuates. So you'll go hmm. from extremely depressed to extremely happy, like right, like it. So it's like a massive fluctuation. Where I guess typical depression is probably that that constant of, of feeling down. Where atypical, you go from one extreme to another extreme. Sure, interesting. Um, which but I could imagine only you know if it was like in even the space of a day, going from the the absolute bottom to to right up to the top would be full on be very uh you know taxing very very stressful and yeah and you would feel yeah. you would feel the lows more because you have a reference yeah. point because you were just at a high you know yeah 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 so it must be it must be brutal mm. um few of lovecraft's and his mother's activities between late 1908 and 1913 were recorded lovecraft described the continuation of their financial decline uh, one of Susie's friends Clara Hess recalled a visit in which Susie spoke of Lovecraft as so hideous that he hid from everyone and did not like to walk upon the streets where people could gaze on him. Wow. Uh, That's, uh, yeah. It's been as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although for this part, Lovecraft said that he found his mother to be a positive marvel of consideration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a neighbor pointed out to others in the neighborhood that they often assumed loud nocturnal arguments between mother and son were actually Shakespeare reenactments, which is an activity that delighted them both. Yeah. Um, I can just imagine walking down the street, you know, one night and you just hear people screaming at each other, but the neighbors, you know, yeah. like, oh, they're at it again. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Is that? Is that old English? <laughs> yeah. They're yelling. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Shakespeare. Yeah. Oh, Shakespeare. Oh. oh, I like this. Is this Macbeth? <laughs> In 1916, Lovecraft published his first short story, The Alchemist, in the main United Amateur Press Association journal. Due to the encouragement of W. Paul Cook, another UAPA member and future lifelong friend, Lovecraft began writing and publishing more fiction, The Tomb, and the Dagon was soon to follow. The tomb being greatly inspired by the style of Edgar Allan Poe, as per Lovecraft's own omission. Meanwhile, Dagon is considered to be Lovecraft's earliest work that embodied the concept and theme that would later be known for. Lovecraft published another short story, Beyond the Wall of Sleep, in nineteen nineteen, which would first be his which would be his first science fiction story. It tells of a man who finds himself compelled to acts of savage violence through telepathic communications from an unknown alien race. Wow, uh, D- Dagon is a is a brilliant story. Um, again, that's one that goes for like fifteen minutes in the audio book, and it's it's oh man, it's well worth a listen. And I can get these on Audible. Yep, Audible dot com slash Hobby Homies. Use the discount. <laughs> we, haven't got, we haven't got that yet. Oh, dude. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can just find this on any generic audio book. Uh, 
application. Absolutely, yep. yeah. Probably right, even cool. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. YouTube.com slash Hobby Homies. Yeah. Discount it, check it. <laughs> During the winter of 1918, Lovecraft's mother, Susie, exhibiting symptoms of a nervous breakdown, went to live with her eldest sister, Lillian. Her friend, who had visited her years before, Clara Hess, recalled Susie describing weird and fantastic creatures that rushed out from behind buildings and from corners at dark. In the same account, Clara described running into Susie downtown and she did not recognise her. Whatever the causes, in March 1919, they resulted in committing her to the Butler Hospital, like her husband before her. Okay. Lovecraft's immediate reaction to his mother's commitment was visceral. He wrote that existence seems of little value and he wished that it might terminate. Mm. During a time at Butler Hospital, Lovecraft visited her on occasion and walked the large grounds with her. Uh, so, sounds pretty hereditary. Yeah. Yeah, there's a strong yeah, family link there to, um, I guess, mental mental illness of, of sorts. It's interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, is he on his own now? How Do you know at this point how old Lovecraft at is? At 1919, he is 29. Okay. Yeah, I so, don't know about the era, so, but I mean, I know it sounds like he's a bit, um, you know, he's, he hasn't moved out with his girlfriend yet. You know what I'm saying? No, nah, no. There's actually there's nothing that states of him even having a girlfriend mm. up until later on. Yeah. Um. So at 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 the age of 29 in this time period, you should be married with a house with kids. Yeah, you, you should know? have like that 19 was... kids or something. Yeah, at least yeah, yeah, at least nineteen, and a library room, a family library, <laughs> and a room. library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, was he still living? At I home, guess. Did you say? Yeah, he yeah. was. Yeah, yep. So he's yep. He's on his own now for the first time. Well, he actually um, he moves in with his aunts after this, his mum is committed. Period, to after the, his mum, yeah, yeah, after she gets committed to hospital. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Late 1919 saw Lovecuff become more outgoing. After a term of isolation, he began attending writers' gatherings with friends, the first being a talk in Boston presented by Lord Dunsany, whom Lovecraft had only recently discovered and idolised. See, this is a time period when you could be a lord. Yeah. You know? For, for what? <laughs> I don't know, dude. <laughs> I don't think you need it. owning land, I think. Yeah. You know, if you, if you own like more than... I don't know, a, a normal house block, you're instantly a lord. If if your domain has more than three libraries, you're yeah. a lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The next year at an amateur writing convention, Lovecraft met f- uh, Frank Belknap Long. Wow. Who would, end up, are incredible, <laughs> who would end up being Lovecraft's closest confidant for the rest of his life. What was his name the again? Influence, Frank Belknap Long. Belknap Long. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> old Nappy. Yeah. The Napster. The Napster. And he is yeah. old mate's closest friend now. For yeah. Now until- yeah, basically. A close confidant for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah, well. Wow. Yeah. The influence from Dunsany is present in Lovecraft, Lovecraft's 1909 put output Dream Cycle, which features which is a series of short stories set in the dreamlands, a vast alternate dimension which can only be entered through dreams. Stories from this series include The White Ship, the Doom That Came to Sarnath, and The Cats of Ulthar. The Cats of Ulthar. Have you have you read that one? Listened? I've Yeah, I've listened to that is one. Is it about yep. actual cats? It is, yeah. Yep. Um, Ulthar is the town where uh, no man may kill a cat. Oh, my God. So, heaven. He's just renamed Basically. heaven. <laughs> yep. Yep. Are there lots of cats there? <laughs> there are. Oh, my God. There are. That's the first one. And they... Uh, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Wait, is it like... Dark? Do the does anything happen to the cats? At the start, okay. But they get their vengeance. Don't worry. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm leave. Um, I'm gonna leave you with all the homies, and I'm gonna listen to Revenge of the Cats or whatever it was called. All right. By the time you finish listening, to it, I'll probably still be going. Yeah, You're only no going for twenty minutes. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> what was that one called again? The Cats of Ulthar. Cool. I don't know why I asked you now. Yeah. I can just ask you after the show, but. Yeah, I'm make a note here. The cats. Are That's fine. The homies might have been asking the same question. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Late 1920, Lovecraft began working on the earliest of one of the earliest stories, which would soon be known as a, as the Cthulhu mythos. Um, now, straight away, Cthulhu, Cthulhu, Cthulhu. There's so many different pronunciations. Um, 
none of them are actually correct because the language is Rilechian, which is something that humans cannot pronounce. Oh. So call it what you like. I, I fluctuate between Cthulhu and Cthulhu. Okay. I've heard nothing yeah. but Cthulhu. Yeah. I think that's the, like the most accepted because that's sort of how you would pronounce it in English. Sure. You know, Not that C-T-H-U-L-H-U. No. No. <laughs> English got no idea what it what it's doing, let alone what yeah, other language let alone is doing. Let alone Yeah. My favorite <laughs> language, by the way, Rilechian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a term coined by later authors, which encompasses Lovecraft stories that share a commonality in the revelation of cosmic insignificance, initially realistic settings, and recurring ent- ent- entities and texts. The following year became The Nameless City, which is the first story that falls definitively in the Cthulhu mythos. In this story is one of Lovecraft's most enduring phrases. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons, even death may die. Recited by Abdul al Hazred, a prominent character throughout the mythos, known for dealing in forbidden magic, and the author of the infamous Necronomicon, or also referred to as the Book of the Dead. Hmm. There's a lot to unpack there. Yep. I've had too many beers to even begin. <laughs> you said a lot of things. So his main themes, you you summed that up pretty well. You said he, the, mm-hmm. the main, uh, was that the main themes of Lovecraft from then on or like the, the Cthulhu ethos? Yeah, in the Cthulhu mythos. Mythos, um, sorry. That... Yeah, yeah, that's the sort of the one particular universe which encompasses a lot of his stories. Sure, um, and that yeah, and that said, it it comprises mostly of strange beings. What was it? I, I liked it. Yeah, it was- so it was stories um, that share a commonality in the revelation of cosmic insignificance. Cosmic insignificance. Initially, yep. realistic settings. Yep. And recurring entities and texts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So cosmic insignificance is something, you know, that's so grand that just makes you feel insignificant, you know? And this, like, just the settings initially realistic suggest to me that they slowly unwind and become less realistic. Yep. So you first think yeah, you're in a yep. familiar world and then it becomes more and more. Absolutely. There. Yeah. And yeah. Abstract. Da- Dagon does a, f- the story Dagon does um, a fantastic um, unpacking of that, you know, like it starts off with a guy on a boat and then it, it just, yeah, it spirals. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just tried to, so yeah. On a side note, I just tried to wipe my nose off camera <laughs> and I went like this. <laughs> It's nowhere near enough. <laughs> <laughs> nice, dude. I moved nice. three inches to the left. <laughs> <laughs> you should, should think about your framing a bit better, dude. Yeah, I didn't even. I didn't even look. <laughs> I was staring at you. <laughs> it's like I hope Shane doesn't notice. It's like they won't see me if I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I blocked slightly more of the Hobby Homies logo on camera. And now I drew it to attention to yeah. the people listening uh, uh, through audio mediums too. So. I've undone all my hard work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's become clear how little... You could have got away by about 50% of it, dude. Yeah, but... I reckon. Oh, well. Oh, well. Yeah, great. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that helps me sum up because, I, like I said, I know nothing. I've heard people say Cthulhu Lovecraftian and I thought it was this weird, like, um, I guess, mythical mashup with realistic settings. So that's helped me sort of picture yeah. that I was kind of on the right. Like, it, it starts off feeling quite realistic in his stories and then it... I completely unwinds and unravels um, and that theme of cosmic insignificance yep. I'm sure is, is something that is brought more present as the story continues so at the start you probably feel like that's not a Absolutely. theme and then yeah interesting I love that everyone else who knows what yeah. Lovecraftian yep. style things are is just like Fox is just it's got no idea <laughs> but they know <laughs> they know <laughs> So, but now you know too, dude. I do. So I do. I, I've learned so much from just doing this. Like it's, it's, inc- it's insane. Yeah. What a talent. It's really insane. What an iconic figure, especially in yeah, yeah our war gaming. Yeah. What a great deep dive, dude. Anyways. Yeah. This has been. No, just kidding. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I know you got at least six hours more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's about two more pages. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> the Necronomicon. 
is a fictional grimoire which appears throughout the stories of the Cthulhu mythos. It was first mentioned in Lovecraft's 1924 short story, The Hound, though its purported author, the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred, has been quoted a year earlier in The Nameless City. Among other things, the grimoire contains an account of the Old One, their history, and the means for summoning them. The Necronomicon has been featured in works from other authors like August Del- Derleth and Clark Ashton Smith, and throughout other mediums of pop culture. Like the mummy. Many readers, like the mummy, yeah. Many readers believe it to be a real book. <laughs> Get myself a thumbs up. <laughs> Carry on. I saw. <laughs> you earned it, dude. You earned Thanks. it. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> many readers believe it to be a real book, with booksellers and librarians receiving many requests for it. Pranksters, now I say this in air quotes, have listed it in rare book catalogs and a student smuggled a card for it into the card catalog of the Yale University Library. Amazing. Um, it just when I was reading this, the, the term they used, pranksters, listing it in rare book catalogs, was it was a simpler time. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's like, it's like, hey, dude, dude, shut up, shut up. Uh, yeah, I've got a Necronomicon for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that's the way I uh, that's the way I sort of saw it. Pranksters, <laughs> pranksters in, uh, yeah, yeah. Times they are a changing. It went from changing, that to yeah. like crank calls, and then like throwing. Um, what are the little firecrackers called? <laughs> what, what were those? Oh yeah, oh, the I don't ones. remember. Um, pe- um, yeah, you know, they just like yeah, they pop it like it was feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh no, not even those. Now it's like now it's like, oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, there's these, no. they're like little, they're, they're literally like little bombs the size of grapes with a little wick on them. And we used to light them and throw them over the toilet stalls. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Che- cherry bombs? <laughs> Were they cherry bombs? They might have been. But, cherry bombs? Yeah. Something like yeah. that. I think so. Yeah. And now it's like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You hack someone's computer and steal all their Bitcoin and ruin them. <laughs> no, you just cancel them. That's how. True. We cancelled him as you a joke. Ruin their life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no more. Yeah. No more. Uh... Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> how, how Lovecraft conceived the name of this mysterious book is unclear and is greatly disputed. Some suggest that it was influenced by the works of Robert W. Chambers' story, The King in Yellow, which centers on a disturbing play in book form. Mm. But Lovecraft is not believed to have read that work until 1927. Mm. Lovecraft wrote that the title, as translated from the Greek language, reads An Image of the Law of the Dead, breaking it down to Necros for dead, yep. Nomos for law, and Econ for image. So Necros, Nomos, Econ, Necronomicon, if you smash it together. That's interesting Just because in our wargaming, I hear something Nomicon many times. Yeah, it's a term that you they use... Like in video games and and everything, a lot of Lovecraft's work is used throughout. Like one of his stories contains the city of Arkham, which yeah. Batman drew inspiration from. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, so it's it's yeah. I'll later on we'll get into more of like what's known as the Lovecraft Country. Oh, ju- um, juicy! I need another beer. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> go, keep going. <laughs> Just as Lovecraft was beginning to find himself as a writer, he was dealt another blow. Oh. On the 24th of May, 1921, Lovecraft's mother, Susie, died in Butler Hospital due to complications from a surgery only five days earlier. Lovecraft's initial reaction was extreme nervous shock, as he had written in a letter nine days after her death. This left him crippled physic- uh, physically and emotionally. Wow. He was back in the despair he felt when his grandfather died, struggling to see a reason to continue living. That dude just keeps getting punched in the dick. Oh, man. His dad, his grandfather, and then his mother. And like all by, sorry, when was this not in 21? So he's 31 years old. Wow. That's my age. He, yeah. Wow. Nutty. He's copped it. He has copped it. <laughs> and to also like, it's worse for him, right? Because he doesn't sound particularly social. He's got no a, probably a handful of good friends, which is better than none and be- yep. better than 200 fake friends. But- yeah, it sounds like his family has always been his his crux. So to lose, yeah, that's it. That's all of them. Oh wait, he's got his aunts and whatnot, but still, yeah, yeah, still, yeah. 
Um, so the next part in this series, we'll dive into the works Lovecraft became known for, the Call of Cthulhu, mm. the Shadows over Innsmouth. As, uh, we'll also go into what became known as Lovecraft Country, a fictional region based on the New England area of the United States, which contains Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Here we find the fictional city of Arkham and Innsmouth. I might even try and speak some Rihalechian. Hell yeah. Uh, the guttural language spoken by the old ones. <laughs> and you've been practicing with your deep moans, so I have. you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse this time around. <laughs> it sounds like a weak, um, what do you call those big boats? <laughs> like the real big cargo boats. Oh, like it's like a steamer or something. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. 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 Like a weak um, steamer. That's you. So, yeah. <laughs> that is, that's the end of part of part one. Yeah. Um, I was just, just deciphering so much um, and I'm like, I need, I need a part two to finish off this story. Sure. Um, sure. Part two is going to contain a lot more of his work, which people will be familiar with. This is more of a like a setting the scene kind of background thing, right? Yeah. Um, but um, before before we even think about wrapping it up, I just want to quickly read the opening paragraph uh, of the Call of Cthulhu, written in 1926, and is published in 1928. And the the Call Call of Cthulhu is that the first book in the Cthulhu? Uh, what would you call it? Mythos. Mythos. Is it his first nah. one? It's just like no. Nah. The first one was officially the, the nameless city. Okay, but this is yeah. like a main one. I'm guessing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let us have it in Ralechian, right. please. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need some uh, hydration. Okay. I'll fill time with a, a classy. Uh, it, uh, it it's it's fine. I'm I'm, uh, okay. I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Well, <laughs> next time, dude. Okay, next time. Oh, I need sorry, to fill excellent. Up. Good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'll wait my turn. (laughs) The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piercing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. What an uplifting (laughs) piece. (laughs) That pretty much sums up cosmic horror. Yeah. You know, like the, the fact that you and your troubles are so minuscule on the large scale of things yeah like it's kind of like you could die tomorrow and like it, i mean people would care but like it's like it doesn't affect the universe whatsoever right yeah it's you know? existential dread turned up to like yeah. 11 yeah 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 absolutely um not a pl- one of his one of his quotes here that he had uh, i can't quite remember where he said this um but uh he, he's written, all my tales are based on the fundamental premise that common human laws and interests and emotions have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos, cosmos at large. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether time or space or dimension, one must forget that such things as organic life, good or evil, love and hate, and all such local attributes of a negligible and temporary race called mankind have any existence at all. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like having been brought up Christian, then turning to the Pantheon as a uh, a belief of his as actual deities, to then go as atheist as you can and think th- and, yeah. and start to base everything you write on this existential dread where he's like, literally nothing anyone ever does matters on a cosmic scale yeah because and and like there's truth in that in in terms of like being just a blip on the radar of time but man what a what a big theme to just casually uh basically your your entire writings around (laughs) wow yeah thanks for making us feel real small Um, it's actually 
of, of yeah, Lovecraft. He's done a good job at yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I told my um, my therapist what I was researching for a podcast, and she was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> So, she's like you know what Shane? i gotta we've made a lot of breakthroughs gotta, made a lot of progress um uh, just want to know what you're doing on your upcoming podcast uh I th- i'm gonna <laughs> do a deep dive into you know lovecraft hp lovecraft she's like <laughs> i would advise against that at all costs <laughs> yeah, she just said hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so i'll book it our next session know. when are you doing the podcast <laughs> Yeah, in a fortnight. In a fortnight. <laughs> yeah. And fair enough too. Yeah, what a yeah, what yep. a troubled troubled guy. <laughs> what a troubled man. Yeah, I can see his yep. own. It's um, it's. I I I start to wonder if like part of his coping mechanism for losing all these people that are close to him is to really feed into that idea that it's okay they're as big on the right you know they're as big on the timeline on the cosmic timeline as anyone else i would have loved to have a beer with old hp lovecraft <laughs> but he would have just looked yeah, at me and been yeah. like i'm not gonna waste my time with you so like, how many libraries do you have yeah i mean <laughs> i've got a few like uh eighth edition 40k codexes <laughs> which to me is a library because i haven't read any of them it's 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 kind of disappointing though because um, Lovecraft didn't really enjoy games at all. Yeah, or people probably. Yeah, <laughs> or people. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, or existence. That um, seems. And he he didn't like he didn't like writing stories for money. Yeah. Um, okay. He at the end he he had to he um he he had to start writing um because you know his his all the money he was left from his grandfather and his mother eventually dried up um and he managed to start writing for he if he wrote a 2000 story word story he'd get paid five bucks which i mean nowadays is is not nothing back then it might have been a little bit i'm curious um, so what uh what era would he most likely have written most of that would have been like 1920 just do like 1926 maybe roughly around there 1926 see five dollars let's see what five dollars worth was that's five dollars us um, five us in 1926 would in the calendar year of 2021 which is crazy we're in 2021 <laughs> values must be in pounds shillings oh it doesn't go back that far oh huh. okay I thought they would have had dollars back then. Oh well, maybe it was five pounds. Um, I'll try again with this second <laughs> secondary calculator. But if this doesn't work, <laughs> I fear for us. Yeah, you, you, are you on an Australian one though? Because Australia would have had. I'm on a US then. one now. Oh yeah. And this one works, which makes sense. Yeah. So did you say 1926? Yeah. Five dollars. It's twenty-eight dollars. Wow. So it's still. It's nothing. Mm, That's an yeah. hours of work for. Yeah, some people the average average wage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To write Crazy. two thousand uh, words and then get paid thirty bucks. Yeah, once, not every time <laughs> someone reads it, just once. <laughs> just every time someone reads it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that'd be alright. I'd yeah. take that, but yeah, wow, mm. yeah. And uh, it's a shame too because his works really didn't get um, recognition until after his death. So, but we'll go more into that in, in part two. Um, this is a primer and uh, we know about Lovecraft yeah. and you're going to take us into yep. his works and <laughs> when can we expect this next deep dive Shane uh, probably like next month next month next month yeah first week of next four month. weeks from now sure. roughly all right I can deal yep. with that hey four weeks from yep. now might actually be the end of this month one two three anyways four weeks from now yeah <laughs> start next yeah. month yeah <laughs> My math, she know, she know works on good. <laughs> well, thank you for that, dude. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. No, no worries, dude. I hope you and the listeners enjoyed it. I did. I frost it. I frost every moment. I um, I want part two to be now, but understand <laughs> you need more time, and we've already been y- yammering on for like forty five minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's great. It's been a while. It feels like it's been a while since we've done a deep dive. So yeah, 
it has been. But it was it was good to get back in the old saddle and uh, yeah. start diving. Ah, oh, of course, pay. Uh, my sources for this were the HP Lovecraft archive. Yep. And HP Lovecraft: The Life and Career of the of the Influential Horror Fiction Author by Charles River Editors. Cool. Um. Uh, yeah. So that was one of the audio books that I was listening to. Um. While doing this, it, bru- again, brilliant. Like, uh, definitely worth listening to. What is um, your favorite? If you've got like a top three HP Lovecraft oh, stories wow. that you could recommend, or even just give us your favorite one. Man, if I had to pick a favorite one right at this very second, it would probably be um, be Dagon. I reckon Dagon. Yeah, yeah, Dagon. Yeah, yeah. There's some that I haven't listened to yet. Like I haven't listened to anything from Beyond the Wo- Beyond the Wall of Sleep. Um, I listened to The Hound, um, which was another interesting one. Uh, of course, Call of Cthulhu. Um, uh, yeah, and a few and a few others like Mountains, The Mountains of Madness, The Sound Out of Space. Uh, sorry, colors out of space. Um, there's yeah, there's some yeah, really good ones. So, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. You've given me a lot to research before four weeks from now. <laughs> that sounds, dude, it dude, sounds great. Just listen. Chucking one in the drive to work or something. Yeah, that's a great. Good. The great little uh, audio books for only fifteen minutes. That's sweet. Yeah. Little short yeah. stories. That's dope. Um. Can you Hell bring yeah. it back to Wargaming for a second? What is the game you are most excited about or already play that you enjoy or think does the Lovecraftian vibe best? Oof, man, that's good. Um, I can't really think of any games that I play right now that does the Lovecraftian vibe. Yeah, you've got there was, Arkham Horror. There was... Oh, the, the board game. Sure. Uh, Eldritch Horror. Eldritch yeah. Horror, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Arkham. Ah, there is Arkham Horror. That's that's set in the city of Arkham, where Eldritch Horror is set across the across the globe. Sure. Um. So you 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 are an ex, uh, what's the word? Uh, like a detective, like a investigator. I think is the word they use. And you travel to these different sites, and you you're trying to stop these cultists from summoning a particular old one. Um. It, it might be like Yog Soroth or um, Cthulhu or one of the one of the other um eldritch gods um and you fight like you've got to fight like monsters and and shit all along the way so it's it's pretty sick and so and all yeah. of that is based entirely within hp lovecraft's universe and writings yep yeah yep that's cool. set in the 20s 30s that kind of period you know awesome um yeah yeah it's it's, oh, it's so good it's it's a great game solo player as well like you can play single player I played it a little while ago. I think we did a we did a bit of an episode on there. I'm pretty sure it would have been one, one of, of our board, board game. Yeah, yeah, going solo. I think it was. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I see the pun yeah. we used for for that going solo. <laughs> yeah, We're clever sometimes. Not- oh, we sometimes we outsmart ourselves. <laughs> <I think>. <laughs> Constantly, <laughs> constantly. <laughs> I'm always one step ahead of myself. <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> And myself is always three steps behind. So, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's so, great. No worries, dude. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, as always, massive shout out to our patrons, our homies that uh, help us keep doing this stuff uh, with or without global pandemic. Um, honestly, I think I would rather prefer an old one to be waking up than dealing with COVID. But yeah, take what we can get, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. This is the next best thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um. And also, I want to thank uh, our local gaming stores that are doing it probably pr- particularly tough during these times. You mentioned COVID. I just went to throw the dice and snag some goodies. I managed to get myself my very first broken toad brush. Nice, dude. Um, it's a Fugazi, so it's synthetic, but the belly on it looks incredible. And it's got a tip so hot, I call it. Satan's foreskin. <laughs> Satan's foreskin. <laughs> nice. And I picked up the Kill Team Compendium. Don't know if I can legally flick through these pages. <laughs> I jest. I think you can. It's out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. I'm not like a content creator <laughs> worth a penny. So <laughs> so this is for yeah. us to run out uh, Gene Steel Colts and Crute in Kill Team when we could finally play games yep. again, which we were very hyped about as Kill Team Hell players. Yeah. Um, but if you're listening... And don't really, you buy stuff online, don't really care where you get it from. 
we would froth it if you could support our local gaming stores, Ge- Geelong and Werribee. Wow, well, sorry, yeah. Truck and Nina. Between the two of us, there's only a handful of them and they're, <laughs> they're quite small, independent, independently owned. Yeah. Um, our two main ones are, are Guff Absolutely. and Throw the Dice. Find them both on Facebook. Hit them up. Yep. Go on their web stores. They're run by incredible people doing great stuff. And having them run things helps us get in those scenes and cover those things and play in those things. So it helps us tremendously as well. So we'd appreciate if you could support them if you don't care or if you've got your own local, support them. Yeah, absolutely. Check out. So uh, ttdiceonline.com.au. Just.com. And guff dot com dot au just dot com okay guff dot com dot au and tt dice online dot com yeah check out those guys and uh, they've got some great stuff all the all the ranges gw and and uh, heaps of other stuff too and both can order basically whatever yeah whatever you want just hit them up yeah. and be like hey yeah, yeah I, I was thinking about buying these things from this store here's their they i'm pretty sure both would price match you know if you said i'm about to buy this from this store wondering if you can get it in at that same price yeah i i know th- i know throw the dice will i haven't spoken to guff but yeah, yeah. they'll they'll be like yeah sure i'll get that in for you I'm, so i'm sure the lads at guff would check it for out sure, so. for sure yeah so hit them up have a chat oh yeah we'd appreciate that sweet awesome thanks for listening guys and thank you to our pa- patronians oh our yes pat- i started there but you yeah i, I derailed subject. you sorry <laughs> You were okay. guzzling water and I was like, well. I needed to. I've been speaking for 45 <laughs> yeah, minutes. Yeah, you have. <laughs> this is one of the rare episodes where you hear more of Shane's voice than mine. Yeah. <laughs> Few and far between, yeah. but I hope you thought. savor them when you do. <laughs> <laughs> These are the only episodes that get played. Sorry, Matt- <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Massive shout out to Burnsy, Whack, Final Dinosaur, Joey P, Lockie, MJ, Lethal, Moose, and Penny. And Elko, Arkham, Dave, Churchy, Rad, Oliver, Hawkers, Agro, Gritty. Y'all are amazing. We we couldn't do this without you, especially not these no. remote ones. Um, yeah. we, we say it every week, but we still can't say it enough. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Okay, now we've lost them. Give me your best Rylekian. <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> no, next week, next time. I'll just, next uh, time. No, just a little spoiler, a little teaser. <laughs> I feel like you've, you've semi-prepared for this. You've cleared the... Oh, I've practiced a couple of times, all right? <laughs> all right, hang on, hang on. I've got to find, I've got to find the... Um, the f- main f- oh, you need to god find- look at it <laughs> there's can't. so many apostrophes in there <laughs> excellent oh you're gonna butcher this this is gonna be amazing <laughs> <laughs> oh do you know do you even know where to start <laughs> nah <laughs> it starts with ph apostrophe <laughs> oh excellent all right go give it a crack Fingluwi Maglagnaf Kstulu Lilech Lagnach and Fatagin so Immediately, I know that that was perfect, <laughs> and you should yes, be very. I felt like a, I felt like a murloc from uh, World of Warcraft. <laughs> you sound like a murloc. <laughs> that translates to in this house at Rylé, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Oh, I would have guessed that if you had have let me, but alas, here we are. <laughs> Anyways, all of that's staying in. So thank you for listening to the Harvey Heavy's podcast. I've been Fox. <laughs> This has been your I'm, illustrious researcher, Shane. Thank you. Uh, I am now a uh, Cthulhu cult leader, so <laughs> c- c- the button below to sign up to the cult. Anyway, thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for watching and listening. <laughs> Hit the subscribe to join the cult. <laughs> <laughs> Click the bell to call Cthulhu. <laughs> if only it was that easy, dude. If only it was that easy. Toodles. All right. Hooray.